Moon. Okay. <laughs> you, James, go ahead. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this is uh, James Ostrowski from the NYCDSA Debt and Finance Working Group. Uh, we're just here to interview Michael Hudson. Uh, and we'll just go around uh, the room for intros first. So, uh, Alex? Yeah, hi. My name is Alex Kelly. I'm a friend of the uh, NYCDSA Debt and Finance Working Group. Uh, I worked in the New York State Senate on public banking. Uh, and as a journalist, where I've occasionally covered financial matters. Um, and I met our guest, Michael Hudson here, uh, a few years ago uh, when we worked on a piece of journalism together. Michael, you want to introduce yourself? Well, the, uh, there are so many different ways I'd introduce myself to different groups. Uh, I was the economic advisor to Dennis Kucinich. Um, uh, I knew the founders of your original group uh, when I came to New York in 1960. I used to have uh, lunch every Thursday with Max Shackman and Michael Harrington uh, until they uh, ended up supporting the Vietnam War uh, and uh, lost 90% of their uh, subscribers to the uh, Young Socialist Challenge. Uh, classmates of mine recruited uh, Bernie Sanders uh, to the Ipsils, uh, Max Shackman's group in 1962. Uh, and I recently ran into one of them in London. She said he was a uh, social democrat even then. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm a, uh, my father was, uh, I was born in Minneapolis, which was the only city in the, in the world that was a Trotskyist city. Uh, and my parents were working with Trotsky in Mexico. Uh, my father was a political prisoner, one of the Minneapolis 17, uh, grew up in Chicago, uh, came to New York and uh, uh, worked on Wall Street where uh, almost all of the main economists were all Marxists because uh, uh, we understood that the economy was all about exploitation. And if you go to business school and you don't understand that, you're not really going to be very helpful in analyzing where the economy is going. So uh, I did that, wrote uh, Super Imperialism in uh, 1972, uh, having been the balance of payments economist for Chase Manhattan uh, for many years and Arthur Anderson. Uh, and then uh, uh, just begin working with uh, governments. Uh, right now, I'm still a professor at uh, Peking University. Uh, most, all, most of my books are translated into Chinese. Uh, and I also work with other governments. Are you no longer at the University of Missouri at Kansas? Yes, I'm still uh, there. Most of the Missouri, we're all officially on the uh, faculty. Uh, but the faculty, except for uh, uh, the one uh, legal uh, legal uh, specialist uh, has have all dispersed and gone back to uh, uh, back to New York. Stephanie Kelton is in uh, Long Island now, where her husband uh, got a was made head of the history department. Uh, Randy Ray and Pavlina Chernova are uh, at the Levy Institute, where I'm also a uh, uh, have some uh, status there. So, but we're all back here. Uh, the uh, Mrs. Uh, Missouri was supposed to give a matching grant uh, to the million dollars that Warren uh, gave uh, them, but then they found out we were not Republicans and they never uh, uh, gave the grant and uh, uh, it, it just became pretty hard uh, to be there. So Bill Black is the only one of us who's still there. Thank you. And also uh, the Vietnam War was bad. Michael Harrington was wrong. Uh, but yeah, today, uh, I think we're going to try to focus on talking about uh, debt from a few different angles, uh, corporate debt, household debt, uh, international debt. Um, yeah, and there's uh, maybe a few questions that we just wanted to uh, walk through specifically now in the COVID-19 kind of days. Uh, so first, maybe just to kick things off, uh, I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about how the federal response to COVID-19, how it's uh, tended to benefit private banks and the fire sector more generally. 
Well, the response is that uh, the banks have been bailed out at the top of the economic pyramid. Uh, essentially, the, Washington's response is always to bail out the campaign contributors. So the response of uh, Trump has been almost as bad as that of Obama. Uh, it's been a little broader than Obama. At least Trump has not uh, kicked out 10 million uh, families of uh, the debtors. And uh, uh, Trump has not called them uh, uh, the mob with pitchforks. Uh, like Obama called them. Uh, but uh, it, it's obviously the aim of Trump is to use the Federal Reserve money basically to support stock prices. And for uh, Trump and the 1%, the economy is the stock and bond market because that's where their wealth is. And the rest of the economy is just overhead. Factories, business, labor, that to them is just overhead. And uh, they're looking at that as something that should be culled or a cut back. And uh, uh, they've, uh, they've worked with, uh, turns out the uh, Pelosi and the Democrats are even more to the right of Donald Trump. Uh, they made a, a fatal deal uh, with, uh, for the bailout with uh, uh, the Republicans, they said, look, uh, we're no more interested than you are in helping the states uh, or helping the, uh, uh, the employees or the small businesses. So we'll give you everything you want in this uh, first, uh, uh, the first bailout, and then we'll say, we'll follow it up with something else later. And then you can just tell us to go to hell later. And uh, uh, that way we can uh, stick it to New York State and the big states. And the beauty of that is if we can only drive the states bankrupt, then they'll have to privatize their streets and uh, 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 land and their public utilities and their transport. And we can do to New York and America what uh, Goldman Sachs did to Chicago. We can say, sell your streets and your parking meters. We'll give you enough money right now to cover your budget deficit so you don't have to uh, default on your bondholders or us. Um, you can uh, uh, pay us by selling us uh, the rights to uh, all of your natural monopolies, the streets, uh, the subway systems, the uh, any public utilities you have, the parks. Uh, and uh, here's a chance for us to make the biggest, you know, uh, a, a, a huge grab. Uh, we'll, we'll treat New York like uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, English treated the Indians when they came here, uh, basically. So, uh, and the Democrats knew, uh, went thoroughly along with this and orchestrated it uh, so that they would only uh, bail out uh, Wall Street and, and the wealthy uh, corporations, uh, the big corporations. And so, of course, they called it the small business loan, but, uh, which is right. If you realize small business is uh, uh, any, anything uh, under $100 million, uh, you know, uh, you, you, you have to be, have at least, there are, you have to have at least $10 million to be a small business. Otherwise, you know, it's just, just the hobby uh, as far as they're concerned. Yeah, it's funny. It uh, uh, sounds like the the nineteen seventies in New York uh, maybe coming back. Uh, uh, not quite. Back then, they were giving away property uh, uh, I, uh, all around uh, Tribeca, where I lived for twenty years. Uh, I think I, I bought my loft for uh, twenty thousand dollars in nineteen uh, nineteen eighty. Uh, the, and people were just uh, giving away uh, buildings. I don't think that's coming back. Uh, this is because now this is going to be the golden age for landlords, uh, uh, basically. So the government is not really interested in relieving tenants. Uh, it's much more interested in supporting landlord rights. So, be, so that uh, now that landlords have uh, uh, bought most of absentee landlords have bought their property on credit from banks, if the landlords can't collect their rent from the tenants, then uh, they can't pay the banks. And if they can't pay the banks, the mortgage loans will go bad. And then the bank's uh, capital will suffer. And uh, the banks hope to double all their cap to make a killing off uh, this crisis and just uh, be able to pick up uh, cheap uh, property on the cheap. And uh, so basically, the, uh, the bailout is uh, for, for the banks, the uh, private equity firms, and, and the landlords to uh, uh, use the crisis as an opportunity for enrichment by impoverishing the, uh, uh, the losers. How do you explain a program like uh, one of the several Federal Reserve programs, like the Municipal Liquidity Facility? How does that fit into this critique that you just gave, where uh, the whole system is eventually getting set up to enable um, grabbing by those who have. Well, I, I haven't followed the uh, that law 
specifically, so I don't know the details, but uh, I know that just today, uh, government, Governor Cuomo uh, in his press conference uh, said, well, look, we're being, how can it be that the government doesn't bail out New York? They're asking the states to uh, bear all of the costs of the uh, uh, increased unemployment costs, the uh, increased social services. Well, meanwhile, our tax revenues uh, are going way down and uh, they're not uh, bailing us out. So uh, certainly from what uh, Governor Cuomo said, he's not, uh, the, the law is not bailing them out. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was part of the law that he, uh, essentially what he was saying was how on earth, why didn't uh, Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats say, we're not gonna pass the bailout bill unless you take care of the states and the, the victims. Why do you only support the victimizers? not the victims. And the answer is, well, we're the Republicans in the Democrat National Committee. Who do you think we're going to yeah. support? Yeah, and for the municipal liquidity facilities, it was some sum of money, I think uh, 500 uh, billion or so that the Fed could use for short term or up to three year loans. Yeah, but lo you see the loans can't be, re that's the thing. Uh, the loans can't be repaid without either raising the taxes and they can't raise the property taxes because then uh, you'd have building, uh, if uh, the landlords can't pay the mortgage to the bank that they've uh, bought and the banks will go under. So they have to uh, burden labor much more. Uh, if, uh, the only, under, under the way that the bailout, wages have to fall by about 20%. Uh, to be paid in taxes, to be paid to the richest 1% of the population. So it's a huge sucking up of income to the top by using the state and local crisis as uh, 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 the, the vehicle. And they're trying to blow, oh, the, the economy was moving in this direction anyway, uh, uh, since we never really recovered from the Obama bailout of uh, 2009. Uh, but the, the virus only acted, uh, epidemic acted as a catalyst uh, and just sped things up, but it was going in this direction. And, and all of a sudden it gives uh, the, uh, the neoliberals and the right wing an excuse to say, we're doing this because of the virus, not because we're greedy and we want to grab everything. It's not us, it's the virus, but it's not the virus, it's them. Yeah, so this exactly. is the Naomi Klein style shock doctrine takeover of assets. Yeah. Yeah, and that, uh, uh, so um, where do you see uh, public and household debt going in, in all of this? Well, right now, obviously, if you're not employed, if you've have been furloughed, and if you've laid off, uh, and you don't want to starve, uh, you have to use your credit card. So the credit card's going way up, and if you can't afford to make the full repayment, then your credit card interest jumps up from 11% to about 29%. And all of a sudden, this is an enormous 29%. Uh, now that all of the usury laws, you know, no longer exist like they used to, uh, your, uh, your costs are going to go uh, way up. And that means the costs on the other debts will go up too. The credit rating will go down. Uh, I don't see any uh, uh, result except for defaults uh, unless uh, there can be some uh, political movement like yours, saying uh, uh, in, this is a act of God, a natural disaster. So far, the only beneficiaries of the act of God are uh, uh, the very wealthy. Uh, but that wasn't the case in Hammurabi's day in, in the Bronze Age. Hammurabi said that uh, when uh, Adad, the storm god, floods the fields, uh, the uh, cultivators don't have to pay the taxes and they don't have to pay the debts to anyone. And uh, uh, if they've been uh, lost their property, the property is given back to them. Uh, and if they have to give their labor uh, to a creditor, uh, they don't, that's all canceled. So you had more or less regular responses. The whole act of God actually originally was supposed to help the poor. Uh, and the widows and orphans were the poor people. Today, the widows and orphans are the rich people with trust funds uh, that we were not supposed to hurt their uh, ability to live off the uh, uh, tax-exempt state and local debt that the bonds that they're holding. So you, you had uh, uh, history turned sort of inside out uh, by uh, modern finance capital. Yeah. Michael, 
before we started recording, you read to us a piece from uh, the New York Times. Do you have it in front of you? Yes. You, bit of that. Would you read us that line again, please? Okay. This is a, a, a lawyer uh, on, uh, who's working for uh, WeWork, uh, and there's an article in the front of the business section. And the lawyer uh, from uh, Val Walden, Macht, and Heron says, uh, WeWork's customers can get out of their agreements under a provision of New York state law that says an event that is, quote, virtually cataclysmic, unquote, and, quote, wholly unforeseeable, or unforeseeable, unquote, renders the contract void. And that's a tenant co landlord contract, yes? Uh, well, I don't know what kind of a contract it is. It's, uh, presumably, it's a, a landlord contract. Uh, but I wonder whether it goes for other debts, too. Hammurabi would say all the debts, but uh, Hammurabi is not around anymore. But certainly, it would seem to be for renters. So the question is, how many people can say, uh, you know, if uh, uh, the, Washington wants to bail out the landlords, that's fine, but we're not going to pay the rents. And uh, right now, there's a moratorium saying all these rents are going to be due in three months. But if you're a restaurant or a, a neighborhood business and your major expense is paying rent, then uh, this is such a big uh, expense that uh, if you all of a sudden had to pay it in three months, you'd have to work a year or two just to make up uh, the difference that was supposed to go to you is a profit in your own wages or income, and now it's going to go to the landlords, and these, these uh, uh, restaurants and uh, neighborhood businesses are just going to go out, to go out of business. Uh, and if they're personally liable, they uh, might have to declare bankruptcy. So uh, there should be some overall uh, law uh, protecting them. And it sounds like there is a law protecting them. The question is how to popularize it and how to uh, let everybody know they can take advantage of it, not pay the rents, preferably not pay the debts. And uh, they don't have to go on strike. They just have to avail themselves of the law. And also, uh, as far as the history of debt cancellations, uh, Michael's got a, a book, uh, And Forgive Them Their Debts, uh, super interesting history. Uh, it's, it's also interesting to, to bring it uh, up to speed to uh, the year 2020. Um, we're curious if you have any thoughts on, uh, we were reading recently, um, Amsterdam, they had their municipal credit bank buying up young people's debts from creditors and then uh, canceling. Yeah. Uh, is that something uh, um, that, uh, if you're familiar with, you could provide a little bit more color on, or if you see that as a, uh, a potential mechanism to maybe uh, recreate here? The insurance industry has always been part of the financial industry. Uh, and uh, banks usually did their uh, uh, shadowy art activities under, uh, uh, through their insurance affiliates. In 1834 to 36, New York State had a three-volume uh, uh, inquiry into the criminal behavior of the insurance industry. Uh, that just by the side. Uh, in antiquity, the most uh, uh, respectable form of debt was basically to buy shares in a void, to make loans to a, uh, uh, a merchant, tra a traveling merchant, either a ship. Uh, or a uh, caravan uh, in exchange for the proceeds. And basically, uh, lending for insurance ventures was a kind of insurance. It was a kind of spreading of uh, the risk. So uh, it, Holland took the lead, uh, later picked up by uh, England, in sort of turning every kind of gamble or revenue uh, into a financial security. So they would securitize people's lives. Uh, by, uh, and you would have uh, people would give life insurance for uh, uh, very or pensions for various uh, ages and groups, and the uh, the Dutch would buy up the pensions of farm girls, uh, healthy farm girls, because they tended to live a long time uh, and not live in the, live in the cities, and uh, uh, they would get the money that was the uh, not the pensions but the. Uh, uh, the the, the regular income uh, that would be annuities that would be paid for them. So the whole idea of annuities uh, is paid by insurance companies. Uh, and New York State, New York State uh, uh, was very clever on that. They also would sell annuities, but uh, uh, as soon as they had to pay more annuities than they uh, 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 than they got an income, they just go bankrupt. 
and wipe out and not pay any of the annuities. Most insurance money is made by not paying uh, 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 the, uh, the clients and by screwing the contracts. And uh, I was robbed uh, uh, in uh, 1980, and the insurance company uh, said, uh, well, we owe, uh, we're not going to pay you. You're going to have to sue us, and it takes five years to sue. I had to spend $60,000 uh, for the uh, suit, so, uh, and they said is, uh, the way the talk, the law is written. Uh, if we, uh, as soon as you make a claim, uh, we can take your two hundred thousand dollar claim, and uh, we take it off our income ta taxes and expense immediately. Uh, and even though we don't have to pay you any money until you beat us in court, and by the time five years are up, we've been able to make on investment all the money that we would have paid you. So we get. So by stiffing you, we get to, uh, all the money for free from the, from the tax breaks. So the insurance companies are, pro are even more corrupt than Wall Street and almost always have been more, uh, more corrupt. Uh, my insurance company, unfortunately, was Prudential. Uh, I had no I, I didn't realize they were an English company and picked up uh, the usual English uh, stiff the uh, client. And as it happened, my lawyer died. Uh, just the, the day before we were supposed, all of a sudden, uh, got a attack and died uh, before. I had to give my case to Ramsey Clark, uh, to, and then he forgot to put it, we had to take it off the calendar. He forgot to put it back on, and my claim was work, wiped out, and I had a claim against Ramsey Clark, which I've never collected on. So it, it's just my... Uh, uh, everybody I've spoken to has their own story of being screwed by the insurance uh, companies, uh, which are probably the most profitable part of banking because uh, of the way that they've gimmicked the tax law and uh, the fa the, their ability to stiff the customers. And essentially, they, uh, they do what Donald Trump did, uh, the art of breaking the contract, uh, of saying, hey, if you want what you signed for a contract, you have to sue me. And... In, as you know, in New York, uh, it takes about 50000 or 60000 to bring any suit for many years. And so that's why Trump was able to go about screwing his, uh, uh, his workers, his suppliers, his contractors, uh, the banks, and just about uh, everybody. So uh, the, uh, I think it was in 1980 that you had a whole change in economic behavior, uh, both for creditors and uh, for corporations. When Skadden Arps uh, was formed uh, uh, with Drexel Burnham, uh, they realized that uh, the money was be to be made in breaking contracts. You'd make a contract, but unless the other side of the contract was uh, able to put in penalties, there was no penalty for breaking the contract, uh, people would be expecting all sorts of good uh, relationships and the companies that were merged and then uh, uh, breaking the contract was, was how to do it. Now we know, so most of the wealth since the 1980s in this country has been made by breaking contracts, especially breaking uh, for corporations that are rated, breaking contracts with uh, the workers for pensions by uh, uh, either uh, just looting the pension funds or uh, saying, well, we're going to declare bankruptcy and wipe you out uh, uh, if you don't renegotiate your pensions from uh, 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 onto a, a way down. And uh, so you, you'd you think that for the first time, now that there is a coronavirus, that it should be possible for debtors to be able to get out of the contract because that's what the law, uh, the uh, acts of God are supposed to be for, um, if God works for the people instead of just for the, uh, uh, for the banks and the creditors. Yeah, and uh, on the issue of uh, people sort of using the legal system and the sort of, you know, just sue me kind of tactic, do you see any possible potential of, you know, for instance, a, a debtor's union getting together to try to, as a group, uh, renegotiate their debts, or possibly a group of states or municipalities getting together to renegotiate debts with creditors? It, it's hard to renegotiate without uh, doing it within the law. Uh, you would have to have a critical mass uh, in order uh, to avoid uh, the IRS coming down on you or the, uh, the courts coming down on you and uh, 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 moving things. Certainly, you could be able to contest and stall, but the question is, uh, 
uh, the, the corporations already have full-time lawyers uh, working for them. The banks have full-time uh, lawyers working for them. Uh, I, I would want to see, because of the virus ec epidemic and the shutdown, it may not be, it may give uh, debtors a particular advantage right now that they wouldn't normally have. Uh, otherwise, if you don't pay your debts, your, your, your credit rating goes down, you can't get a mortgage, and there can be all sorts of civil disobedience laws. So uh, it, it, it almost has to be handled uh, on uh, a political uh, plane and uh, uh, through politics, through a legal plane, uh, to avoid uh, act, making victims out of yourself. Yeah, and uh, also maybe to uh, rewind a little bit to the uh, uh, state and local government uh, angle. Uh, as you said before, there's less revenue coming in, and this is going to be uh, an ongoing. Uh, there's going to be a lot of austerity fights coming up. Doesn't have to be. Uh, the, uh, I think the states and municipalities should say, either we're going to serve our citizens or the bondholders. We're not going to pay the bondholders. We're not going to default. We're going to say, act of God, we can't pay you. Uh, you want to sue us? Sue us. Uh, and get together with as many municipalities as you can. And uh, I'll just say, uh, uh, we're not going to uh, end up looking like Greece uh, or uh, Argentina and impose poverty on our uh, citizens simply to pay the bondholders. That's not, uh, you know, that, that's the road to neo-feudalism. That's the road to serfdom. We're not going to do it and just uh, say somebody has to lose. And should it be people at the bottom of the uh, economic scale or should it be people at the top of the economic scale? And just on that, are there any uh, maybe examples of, uh, for instance, uh, Mexico, Argentina, Russia, historical examples of uh, governments uh, just defaulting and winding up better for it as opposed to worse for it? Uh, any government that does default is always better for it, uh, but they're not recent examples uh, because uh, uh, in Latin America, the U.S. will simply uh, assassinate anyone, uh, the leaders of anyone who uh, uh, tries uh, to do that. So it's very difficult. Even Greece never defaulted. It should have, uh, 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 the head of Syriza uh, upset all of us who were over there in Greece working uh, with him when they uh, agreed to pay the, the debts instead of just uh, refusing. So uh, in modern times, I can't think of any uh, uh, organized refusal. So you really have to carve new territory out. I mean, in Rome in uh, 490 BC, the Romans uh, just said, well, if you have to pay the debt, we're gonna walk out of the city. And you had the secession of the plebs and they just walked out uh, so that Rome couldn't uh, uh, mount an army you know, and uh, was left uh, uh, without any ones until they negotiated uh, some kind of a settlement. Uh, no, people are not about to just abandon uh, the indebted cities, but that's what would happen to the cities if the cities tried to pay the debts without, uh, you know, by taxing uh, uh, the uh, income earners through an income tax and the sales tax, instead of taxing real estate and the landlords and the corporate business, then that city was, would lose its population pretty quickly because who would want to live? Uh, you couldn't afford to live in New York or you, you cannot afford to live in any city that has to bear the cost of the coronavirus uh, by uh, uh, income tax or sales tax. So it's almost like uh, a slow motion walkout uh, secession of the plebs uh, by that. And the cities should realize we're not going to commit economic suicide to pay the 1%. Uh, we're not going to pay uh, the bills. Uh, if you don't like it, then give us, then you print the money in Washington to pay us, the cities and states, not just uh, uh, your campaign contributors. But what consequences, Michael, could cities expect if they did this? Uh, what disadvantage might they suffer? Because this is what politicians are going to be worried about, and it's the reason, it's the excuse that they're going to give for not doing what you prescribe. They'd make New York the nice, and any city doing that would be the nicest place to live because it would be like the German economic miracle when its debts were canceled uh, in 1948. Uh, a debt-free city will be much better than a city that doesn't have to pay debts. 
Uh, and uh, you can be pretty sure that the landlords and the bondholders uh, would go to Washington and Washington would just print the money out to give them. So, uh, so uh, uh, everybody will end up much better off when the debts are not paid. Um, isn't, I mean, cities exist in the complexity of, a, of an economy that is integrated regionally, nationally, internationally. Um, so I think what most people think is that there are going to be consequences. Uh, people are going to, people who have money, uh, who are the source of private investment, um, which, uh, you know, we don't have public investment right now. So uh, cities, you know, cities fell all over themselves in, in competing to, to get Amazon to come, right? And yep. so if I understand you correctly, yep. you're, talk, Look, you're, Amazon, talking, Amazon. you're talking about saying we're not going to play by those rules anymore. We're going to take care of ourselves. Yeah. Um, but then private capital can react and respond. And I think it's out of the fear and, and ignorance of, of what they'll do, which could hurt the cities and what cities can do to protect themselves, that you have a lot of politicians, local and state elected officials, saying, nah, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to follow Alexis Tsipras. We're going to we're just going to put our heads down and keep playing the game. Well, cities don't never have to give special tax breaks to uh, companies like Amazon. And look at how much better New York is for not having Amazon move in. Remember, uh, uh, AOC was opposing uh, Amazon, and now you have uh, someone running against her saying, oh, gee, look, uh, we're all broke because Amazon didn't move in, but we're not broke. Other companies all moved in. They say, hey, uh, uh, if Amazon wants to move there, it turns out Long Island City is a great place. They all moved into Long Island City, and you didn't need Amazon. You had all these other companies that actually pay taxes. So New York's uh, done uh, much better by not kowtowing uh, uh, for the big uh, firms and, uh, and their lo lobbyists. Uh, there are many more uh, taxpayers than there are bondholders, so the taxpayers uh, can vote in whatever politicians they want. Uh, but they can't bribe the politicians like the, uh, uh, the uh, bondholders and uh, the financial sector tends to do. So they have to somehow organize a way to uh, bypass the bribed uh, politicians or the, uh, the creatures of Wall Street uh, who are uh, pretending to be populist, but uh, actually turned out to be Democratic National Committee uh, thugs. But what can small cities and counties do who don't have the... Work with others, work with bigger small cities and more counties band together and say, this is something that we're all in it together. Uh, you know, so that maybe uh, an, a small upstate New York uh, county that's already pretty broke, can't do very much, but if the works of the whole other uh, bunch of other counties uh, uh, and tries to mobilize uh, a large statewide group, then they can, they can uh, get together and just say, we're not going to turn over uh, the revenue uh, uh, to the state or to the government. Uh, we're, we're not, we're not going to do it. And what is going, what will the government do? The most uh, voters would be very sympathetic with such a, such a move. Yeah. And maybe that also uh, brings us back. Uh, you were talking a little bit uh, earlier about uh, what's similar or not similar to New York in the 1970s um, where uh, uh, and you also mentioned uh, uh, Greece. Uh, Puerto Rico is maybe another example. Puerto Rico, right. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'm just curious if you could uh, uh, maybe say a little bit more about what makes this time different and maybe if there are any other historical positive examples of uh, how to better deal with uh, the needs of uh, politicians making arguments that we need access to the capital markets. We need to do bend over backwards to get uh, uh, private investments. Well, when I first came to New York in 1960, uh, the rent that I was paying was $35 a month uh, on Sullivan Street, uh, right near uh, NYU. Now it would be $3,500 a month. It's gone up 100 times. So the big difference, and even since 1980, uh, the rents were very low. There were a lot of rents of $100 a month uh, on the Lower East Side where I was living, uh, and buildings, you know, would, were uh, very inexpensive. There's been an enormous increase in wealth. This, uh, and all this is increased by the land value, which is a result, uh, the landlord didn't create this land value. 
uh, the uh, land values increased by the city's prosperity and by the uh, public services and by the transportation. So uh, New York should have actually uh, raised, it, there was no need at all for uh, a sales tax or even a New York state income tax. It could have taxed property. If it would have taxed housing and real estate, that would have held down the real estate. Then it wouldn't cost uh, a, a $4,500 a month as an average rent in Manhattan. It wouldn't cost a million dollars uh, to buy an apartment. It would be, all of that would be affordable. So the first thing to do, uh, and this is of course what Henry George wanted to do in New York back in eight. 1975, when he ran for mayor, uh, and uh, uh, the vote was uh, fixed against him. But uh, George said wanted to uh, make a land tax uh, uh, the whole basis of uh, fiscal revenue, and that was a, a wonderful idea at that time, and it's still a wonderful idea again. Uh, and uh, N New York can simply uh, finance the deficit through a real estate tax. The good part of that is it'll drive most of the uh, buildings uh, uh, bankrupt because the landlords have, don't even use their own money to buy their buildings. It's all borrowed money. So it'll force, uh, it, the, the, the burden will be uh, on the banks and it's been the banks and the real estate sector that have made all of the gains since 19, 10, uh, 2009 uh, or 2008. Uh, since 2008 to today, uh, all of the growth in GDP and national income has, has only accrued to 5% of the population. 95% of America's population has less GDP and less income than they had as a result of Obama's uh, uh, policy. So uh, you, want to recap you want to recapture this artificial free lunch wealth. You want to get the free lunch back, and you want to get it by taxing uh, finance and real estate. And the good thing is, if, if one of the uh, worst banks, like Citibank, would go under, then you can make it into a public bank. And uh, actually uh, use it for productive loans, not uh, predatory loans. And actually, maybe that's a transition right there. Um, so you work with the uh, Public Banking Institute? Uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm a friend of Ellen Brown, and uh, I think that public banking is... Uh, uh, less uh, corrosive than uh, private banking. Public, a public bank wouldn't make corporate takeover loans. It wouldn't lend to corporate raiders. It, it wouldn't uh, make predatory uh, loans to uh, uh, payday uh, lenders. It, it would itself uh, uh, extend loans to the people who need it at less than 100% a year you know, just normal rates. It would provide banking services locally. It would, uh, uh, there's a need for public banking. And uh, I think banking originated uh, in ancient times in the public sector. Uh, and I think uh, the, pri the privatization of money and credit uh, has been a disaster for, uh, uh, for most countries. Definitely. Michael, if, James, did you want to follow up? Yeah, you go on, yeah. Um, I want to uh, stay on this topic for a little while because um, I've read a few of your books um, and I'm reading and, and forgive them their debts a second time right now um, because it's so full of information. Um, it seems like um, your uh, large thesis, your general thesis when it, with respect to finance, um, born out through your work as an economic historian, your work uh, with Chase Manhattan um, and uh, in other roles as, as an analyst. Um, your thesis is that finance doesn't do what most people uh, and what economic textbooks uh, say it does. It, it, it doesn't, we, I remember taking a walk next to a, in college with a friend who um, was saying, well, if you get rid of the banks, this was during 2008, this was during the, the crisis. Uh, the banks are the source of our wealth. If you get rid of them, or if you take them over, then you inhibit society's ability to uh, create money to fuel industry. What you're saying is that that's a misunderstanding of what finance actually is. They say that that's what they do, but because it's privatized um, and a small community of people control it, uh, those people use it uh, to get industry and other parts of the population into debt and then pry their resources and wealth and land and assets from them. And that's what finance, that's the role of finance in our society. It's a predatory institution. 
uh, for private interests. Well, you said a, yeah, a number of things uh, regarding uh, the 2008. Nobody was talking about destroying the banks. What Sheila Baer, the head of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, said was, we've got to take over Citibank. It's broke. It has zero net worth. Zero net worth. Uh, it's all, it was lend out uh, the loans it made, it lost, for acting in a criminal way illegally breaking the law, and it made so many bad gambles. It was so badly managed the bank that uh, we can take it over and uh, we will not make the bad loans. We're not gonna make uh, corporate takeover loans. We're not gonna loan to crooks and we're not going to falsify mortgage loans uh, like they did. Uh, and if we do, then our people will be thrown in jail like I'd like, like they do. She wrote her uh, uh, autobiography about all of this, explaining just why Citibank should have gone under. All the depositors would have been fully insured. No depositor would have lost uh, uh, their insured money. Some of the rich depositors would have because they put their money in what she called a crooked bank, an incompetent bank. Uh, but what you're raising is an even deeper issue. You're talking not only about crooked banks like uh, uh, Citibank or uh, Wells Fargo or uh, the Bank of America, uh, but just the normal financial sector. In the textbooks, banks are supposed to make loans to industry, to build factories that are going to employ workers uh, and increase employment. But that, banks don't make any loans at all for, to start up business. They, they don't make loans to start a business or to build a factory or to get a restaurant. They only make loans against collateral that is pledged uh, businesses already existing. They will make loans to a corporate raider to buy a business that's already created, but they won't make any loan to create the business to begin with. So their role is only predatory, concerned with the transfer of uh, companies or the transfer of real estate or the transfer of wealth at a rising, a rising prices because a house is worth however much a bank is going to lend. And as banks have loosened their mortgage standards, the whole increase in uh, housing prices is a result of banks lending more and more money, more and more recklessly, uh, so that more and more people's income has to go to pay the mortgage interest or the rents to cover the mortgage interest uh, on, uh, uh, on, on bank loans. And uh, uh, so the banks have become, the, the, uh, they were long called a century ago, the mother of trusts, but they're also uh, uh, linked to uh, essentially predatory finance capital that works in a very different way from industrial capital. Uh, it works only in an extractive way uh, to uh, basically uh, operate against the interest of its customers, not uh, in their favor. Uh, the, cu uh, the customers have to end up paying because the banks are uh, basically work with the very largest, with the 1% of the largest companies and the richest people and uh, they help these uh, large companies, uh, corporate raiders, essentially work uh, in ways that uh, uh, they pay more stock dividends or stock buybacks uh, for, by uh, uh, stiffing uh, the pension funds or uh, you know, working uh, labor more intensively or cutting back employment or basically moving their employment abroad. It's basically the financial managers, Wall Street that's decided, let's uh, not produce in America. Let's uh, uh, produce in China and low-wage countries, uh, and uh, that'll have the effect of pushing down wages here. So uh, finance has become part of a class war against uh, employees uh, and against small business and really against the middle class. When you say just become, um, there was a shift in the 20th century where, uh, well, you, you studied finance going back thousands of years. So can you contextualize that? Because there is a, initially a public, a sort of public purpose to finance, but there's this, this push and pull, right? Where this gets used for public purpose and community purpose and then seized by um, elites who possess wealth, who get control. And then it, there's a pendulum in history. Well, almost all, all great family fortunes have come from uh, seizing the public domain. Uh, in Roman times, uh, it was uh, grabbing uh, land, uh, uh, grabbing public land uh, for oneself, or it was uh, just militarily e uh, e expropriating uh, the landowners, or it was uh, making a loan that couldn't be repaid and you foreclose and you get the land of other people. Uh, the Bible is all full of stories like that uh, uh, about uh, uh, 
expropriating uh, uh, tenants and grabbing, grabbing their land and depopulating the land. Uh, the original creditors were the palaces of Babylonian, the Bronze Age. And for, for 2,000 years, uh, from Mesopotamia, Sumer and Babylonia, down through the first millennium, uh, the, main, uh, the main creditors were the palaces and the temples. The temples were part of the palatial economy. Uh, but uh, from Greece and Rome didn't have uh, temples and palaces. So everything was sort of in the private sector, taken into a new context. And uh, banking became uh, very private uh, at that time. And it really uh, uh, devel uh, developed in the uh, 12th and 13th century in the West uh, with the uh, Knights Templar, when the, the biggest banks were the church. The Knights Templars were a church uh, banking order to finance the Crusades and the Hospitallers uh, were another banking order. So uh, then gradually uh, there were wealthy families around the, the papacy uh, that uh, ended up, the Italian bankers, uh, that would basically lend, make loans uh, to kings and to national uh, uh, national uh, loans in exchange for monopolies. And so uh, from the Renaissance to the early Reformation, through about the uh, 18th century, uh, international lo uh, loans would be made in exchange for a private monopoly, such as the South Sea Company or uh, the, the Bank of England. Uh, investors got together and lent uh, uh, 1.2 million pounds to England and got uh, the Bank of England as a, uh, as a, uh, a monopoly. And you had... Uh, uh, in the United States in uh, 1913, uh, you had the Federal Reserve created. Well, until 1913, the, the government didn't really uh, need uh, private banks uh, uh, to finance uh, its debts. In the Civil War, the government just printed the greenbacks. Uh, in 1913, and the, the, the Treasury handled almost all of the uh, central, the financial planning of the United States. Uh, J.P. Morgan organized a group of people and said, we've got to get the government out of banking. We've got to privatize it. And uh, we've got to move it out of Washington into New York and Boston and Philadelphia. And so uh, he, he, the private banks organized the Federal Reserve to take uh, the planning power away from the Treasury and away from Washington. And the result uh, is that uh, after World War I, essentially, uh, America became a centrally planned economy, not by Washington or politicians, but by Wall Street. Uh, and we're, right now, the economic planning uh, is done by the financial managers, by Wall Street, and they do it in the interest of, of uh, finance, insurance, and real estate, working together is the fire sector, working together to extract money from the rest of the economy. And so banking uh, has ceased uh, to play a role of financing industry. It finances the deindustrialization not industrialization. It finances the dismantling of industry, the outsourcing uh, of industry and the downsizing of industry. Uh, and uh, that's just a, uh, that's what's made America deindustrialized. That's the result of financial planning instead of uh, uh, industrial planning like we used to have. And I'm curious if you could maybe say a little bit more about the relationship between uh, capitalism and imperialism you have talked a little bit about the distinction between industrial capital and financial capital and how uh, industry has kind of moved. Uh, I mean, it's moved out of New York. Uh, a lot of it's moved uh, uh, to other places all over the world. Uh, but could you maybe uh, elaborate on that a little bit? Well, I want, uh, there's a great book of uh, why New York was uh, deindustrialized by uh, Bob Fitch. Uh, the the, some, the dismantling, of New, I'm blocking out the name, uh, the dismantling of New York, showing how the plan to get, when I came to New York, even in the 60s, the, uh, the Tribeca was a very low priced shopping area for electronics. There were shops all over. There were dairies, uh, dairy companies. There were nut companies. There were importers. It was all an industrial uh, district. Uh, but all, already in the 1920s, there was a central plan uh, drawn up for New York. And the plan was, let's get rid of the industry. Let's get rid of the workers. Let's gentrify. 
uh, the uh, city. And basically the plan for a hundred years has been to, to gentrify New York and make money for real, use New York as a vehicle to make money for real estate developers uh, and landlords, uh, uh, not, uh, not for a, the kind of balanced industry uh, that it used to have uh, even uh, 60, year, uh, 60 years ago when I moved here. And is this book The Assassination of New York? Yes, The Assassination of New York. It's a great book. And uh, it doesn't, uh, regarding imperialism, uh, there's really no, uh, imperialism has very different uh, uh, facts. Imperialism is simply a means of exploiting other countries and getting a free ride and making other countries pay for uh, your military expense of surrounding them and uh, forcing them to uh, uh, produce uh, things for you and letting your investors buy control of their most profitable industry. So uh, you impoverish their, impo their population in order to enrich your ruling class with some of the money spilling over to the rest of the population. And also, uh, um, we've touched on this a little bit, uh, we, but we've talked about um, private household debt. We've talked about state debt, uh, a little bit about international debt, but we haven't talked as much about um, corporate debt and uh, whether we're living through what looks like a bubble uh, and what role the private banks might have created in, uh, uh, in that. So um, I uh, wonder if you could say a little bit more about uh, the current state of corporate debt. Well, there's supposed to be a law in the book uh, and there used to be in um, colonial times in New York saying that if you make a loan to someone without any idea of how he is going to repay it, that law is null and void. Uh, for instance, a, a lawyer told me, and I haven't been able to find the law, that uh, before the revolution, uh, British uh, speculators would come. They would make a loan to uh, a farmer, uh, especially in upstate New York, and then they would demand payment just before the uh, harvest was in and the farmer couldn't pay until after the har harvest and they'd foreclose on the land. So uh, apparently there, there was a law at that time saying if you make a, a loan to someone without knowing how he can pay, the loan is null and void. Well, many corporations have been bought out by uh, uh, private equity companies. The, the first thing they do is they borrow the money to buy the corporation. So all the money they borrow to buy a company will be added on to the, uh, the corporate debt. That's what uh, uh, you've, you've seen Sears, J.C. Penney the other day go bankrupt. Uh, all of these, uh, the major retailers in the United States have gone bankrupt because uh, uh, absent uh, speculators have borrowed money from Wall Street saying, give us enough money to buy Sears and J.C. Penney. They, uh, they'll take over the company uh, and then they'll, they'll say, we're going to divide you in half. Uh, so now here's your real estate. Uh, or like Macy's, uh, you'll uh, uh, give us the real estate. Maybe we'll give you a dollar for the store, but you'll have to pay, uh, and we'll give maybe a hundred, uh, they'll give more than that. But then uh, we'll give you enough money right now that you can afford to do business while paying us enormous management fees and enormous, all the interest on our debt. And uh, then you'll uh, pay, uh, you'll sign a lease and uh, you'll lease back, you'll lease the store, we'll lease the store to you. Uh, and uh, the, uh, they will own uh, uh, the store. Uh, the, the, the splitters will hold uh, the real estate and use the store to drain all of the money uh, within the, the company. Uh, the, the process was uh, refined by the University of Chicago uh, crooks uh, in uh, Chile. And uh, they worked with Pinochet, said, you know, here's a, uh, first, first of all, we're going to uh, assassinate every labor leader, every uh, land developer. We're going to close every economic department in the country because you cannot have free enterprise if you're not willing to, to kill everybody who doesn't believe in your free enterprise. We're a free market and free market means you can only have a free market with totalitarian control. So they, they put in uh, Chile, they, were, uh, they killed tens of thousands of uh, leaders and the, uh, they turned uh, essentially uh, companies over to what were called grupos, uh, the wealthy Chileans. And they would buy, uh, buy a company, uh, they would uh, ma make a very 
nice uh, pension promise to the workers. They'd buy the company, they'd split the company into a real estate company and uh, uh, a banking company. The bank would, uh, uh, would become a holding company uh, that would hold the companies. They would then uh, use the uh, actual uh, uh, employing company, employer, to uh, pay uh, so many uh, interest payments, rents, and uh, management fees to the, uh, the owners that all of a sudden they, the pension funds would all be wiped out. And uh, the, the whole plan of corporate debt was to uh, uh, make uh, the uh, corporate debt owed to the parent uh, financial manager so that they could wipe out the pensions. And uh, almost all of the profits made by many American companies have been the grabbing of the pensions that were supposed to be uh, accumulated on behalf of the uh, uh, the employees, uh, so that uh, the corporate debt is a means of uh, forcing uh, uh, avoiding pension payments uh, and forcing down wages by saying there's no money to pay your wages because all the money that used to be paid for wages is now being paid for interest, rent, and management fees to the uh, corporate. Uh, uh, restructuring specialists. So money's made by financial engineering, not by industrial engineering. Yeah, and on the pension issue, there's another uh, great book, uh, Dismantling Solidarity by uh, Michael McCarthy, which is a uh -huh. very uh, interesting read. Um, so um, uh, you've mentioned that uh, all this corporate debt is sort of, uh, uh, it seems like it's designed to put a lot of the costs onto the pension funds, and, um, and to the and to the workers, and ultimately to uh, corporate uh, to at uh, the cost to avoid paying taxes, uh, because uh, this should be uh, taxed as part of cash flow. Uh, debt payment should be an after tax payment, but uh, because it's it's pre tax, if you can replace dividends by uh, debt payments, then uh, you stiff the tax collector, and by uh, by business not paying debt because it has not paying uh, taxes, but paying debt. And the creditor now is, uh, they have a special vehicle in the Cayman Islands or Panama or you know an offshore banking center. Uh, that, uh, there's no money to pay uh, liability to pay taxes. And so the governments have to support themselves, not by taxing corporate cash flow, which they should, but by, uh, uh, and not taxing real estate, but by taxing labor uh, either through income tax or by the sales taxes that fall mainly on consumers. So yeah, and uh, is this sustainable or what do you see as the, the next steps? Uh, I know that uh, based on what you said, it's, uh, uh, there will be some people who are looking to pass the, uh, the costs of this onto the pension funds, but uh, um, as far as this corporate debt bubble, uh, uh, what do you see as happening next? Well, I, uh, obviously, uh, you had Mitch McConnell saying, well, if, come, if uh, states are running a, a deficit, then let them use the pension funds to pay the bondholders. Now, who's going to have to bear the cost? Is it going to be the 1% or the 99%? That, that's what the politicians are not talking about. And they're not because the Democrats are in, are in favor of the 1%. The Democrats are even to the right of the Republicans, which is why I think uh, Donald Trump is going to win the election by making a left left run around uh, whoever the Democratic nominee is. Okay, so um, I think we're getting close to the end. We can end on that bleak note. Uh, are there any? That's not bleak. Uh, not, oh, what that shows is what what you guys have got to do is take over the Democratic Party. You have to realize that uh, the enemy is, uh, you, you need an alternative party because there are only two parties in America, the way it's structured. You need to get rid of the Democratic National Committee. The Democratic Party needs to be broken up in order for you to do any of these things that favor your con the real constituency, the employees and the small businesses uh, instead of Wall Street. And uh, uh, that's what made me so unhappy about the way that Bernie was running uh, in the primaries. He thought he was running against Donald Trump, as if Donald Trump was running was a Democratic candidate. Well, actually, Donald Trump is the Democratic presidential candidate. They're pro you know, how do they get someone so bad to lose to Trump who's doing their agenda that they can still blame it on him? But uh, 
Bernie should have said, look, I'm running against uh, the Democratic National Committee for the so what is the party going to be all about? And he didn't do it. He didn't run, he didn't say this is a, a, the primary is what's the party going to be about? He thought the party's all about, I'm not Donald Trump. And that's, that's social demo democracy, that's, that's trivial. He trivialized his campaign and then evaporated quickly. So you've got to go beyond that. You've got to get someone with guts, not a social democrat, but someone who's actually willing to realize who your enemy is. They, they have to be able to tell, they have to know the truth, I think, as you just said it, and they have to be able to, to overcome media opposition, um, the opposition of all the, the, the propaganda and um, all the ways that the ruling class manipulates people. Um, I don't know if, <laughs> now we're in a discussion about, <laughs> about, we're in a larger discussion, aren't we? Um, so we should, because ultimately you, the question is, once we have these good economic ideas, how are you going to implement them? The block tier ideas and implementing uh, any kind of debt relief or rent relief is going to be the Democratic National Committee because they're on the chart, they're uh, representing Wall Street and the landlords against you. Yeah. Yeah, I've been convinced of that ever since I've read uh, Thomas Frank's work about 10 years ago. Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that created silence in a hurry. I'm sorry, did I offend your group? No, no, no. No, no, no. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, yeah, is there uh, anything else that you would uh, recommend as far as uh, policies? I know you've mentioned uh, public banking, uh, talked about debt cancellations and uh, the need for that. But are there any other... Uh, uh, the tax policy, policy, tax real estate, tax, uh, tax wealth. Uh, you can tax, uh, the real estate tax is exactly uh, what will bring uh, the whole system down. Do not uh, increase the uh, uh, income tax on labor because you'll just drive uh, labor out. Do not uh, increase the sales tax except on luxury, uh, luxury taxes. Uh, so uh, fiscal uh, tax policy turns out uh, to be the key and press for uh, act of God, you know, whatever, if you can do the research on uh, uh, this business is an excuse, uh, see uh, how big an umbrella you can turn that into. Okay. So, Alex, anything else from you? Um, well, I guess just as a summation, what I'm thinking is that um, the, the economy was rotten or rigged to begin with, and COVID is uh, a crisis from the outside, which has uh, revealed and exacerbated these uh, unjust relationships and uh, maldistribution of wealth and power. And... Um, um, the answer to so many questions that I ask uh, seems to be organized and band together, like Michael was saying earlier. Uh, maybe New York City can push some corporations around, but, um, you know, Dutchess County would have to get together with Orange County and Brooklyn and yep. <laughs> other others throughout the state. And so I'm, I, um, there's a, there, that's a promising if, if people can, can get together and do the work and figure out how to band together, which is unprecedented and outside of local elected officials, you know, the way they think about their role, but I think it's what's necessary. Um, I think people have to, we, we have to exceed uh, the stations that have been granted to us. That means you need a new consciousness, a, con a program. You need a, a program and a consciousness of uh, the, not simply the class consciousness of workers versus employers, but debtors versus creditors and renters versus landlords. You have to realize that there are many dimensions to uh, finance capitalism. Exactly. James. Yeah, I mean, Tenants yeah. unions, debtors unions, uh, this all sounds, uh, sounds great. Yeah. James, did you have any new thoughts in the course of this conversation to put you on the spot? But you're my friend, so I'll, I'll oh. do it to you. No, that's okay. I mean, uh, uh, um, it's tough. Uh, I mean, the, the land tax is a, a whole other uh, issue and the whole uh, Georgist uh, school of thinking about that. It's something that comes up every now and then. Uh, and I, I'm not sure um, 
uh, how that plays out. There were, hasn't really been a, a, a movement in New York that's really grabbed onto that as far as the tax policy. Uh, I think following on uh, some difficulties that some jurisdictions have had in trying to implement it in the past. Uh, but uh, um, I don't know, it's, uh, uh, I, I used to listen to uh, Michael Hudson's uh, podcast. So uh, 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 a lot of this stuff is, I mean, uh, history keeps on repeating itself. Well, if you don't, uh, taxing the uh, real estate is the way to tax Wall Street because the real estate is all bought with bank credit and bond credit. So if you don't tax real estate, then you're going to have to tax labor. Uh, if you don't, uh, and why would you want, you, you, you don't want to tax labor and uh, uh, neighborhood businesses and industry. So it's a choice. Yeah. Somebody has to lose. And you want the uh, you want the uh, cost of this epidemic to be paid from the top of the to the winners who've got all this wealth in the last yeah, decade. Exactly, and I think uh, just uh, what I was uh, getting at. Sorry, this wasn't clear as I said it. Uh, there's taxing real estate and there's taxing land, which are two slightly. I'm talking about real estate. Yeah, uh, real estate generally. Real estate. Yeah, I just said land, but it's, yeah. it's, uh, uh, the, the fact is that the, the Georgists are now on the right wing. Of, they've fallen off the right wing of the political spectrum. So I'm not saying uh, work, with, work with them, gotcha. uh, but I am saying uh, tax real estate. And then at a certain point, uh, you can favor. Uh, there's already favoring uh, yeah. new, uh, new construction. So yes, you tax all of real estate because it's yeah. already there. Yeah, and that's, that's definitely, that's been a big part of the, uh, the push to... Uh, uh, for budget justice in New York, a lot of it has been changes to the real estate tax code, which is very, very unjust. It very, very badly undervalues certain properties, so they yeah. get taxed at a, a minor. And you can tax the uh, tax the nonprofits, especially the nonprofits are are the uh, the the vicious edge of the uh, ruling class. I mean, tax the Ford Foundation, ta the biggest landowners in the city, tax the real estate the big real estate companies, Columbia University and NYU, uh, you know, tax the, uh, you know, that give classes in some of their real estate so they get tax exemption for all the rest of their real estate. Yeah, and it's funny, um, this is, uh, uh, sorry, I don't mean to go uh, too far onto a tangent, but yeah, a lot of these endowments were big players in like the Puerto Rico debt crisis where uh, they're kind of on the wrong side of this. I don't know if they were in uh, Greece, but uh, that actually brings me back to one thing that I, I forgot to follow up on. Uh, you were involved in the, the Greek uh, debt uh, negotiations back in? Yeah. Well, I was over, I was working with uh, uh, Jamie Galbraith and uh, the, the whole group over there. There was a, a group called the- uh, M20 the, something? Uh, Delphi, the, uh, the Delphi group. Okay. And we were advocating uh, a debt cancellation on the grounds that the debts were fraudulent. That the, the $50 billion that Greece owed Europe, the counterpart of that was in uh, the Lagarde list of the wealthy Greeks that had $50 billion in Swiss banks that they used for tax avoidance. Yeah. And uh, we wanted Greece to send, uh, Europe to say, okay, uh, take this $50 billion of tax avoidance money, you know, but don't make us pay. We'll go back to we'll go broke. So yeah, uh, we were trying not to uh, to pay, but obviously we were double crossed by uh, the fact that uh, uh, Cyprus uh, sold out. Yeah, and it's funny the early negotiations ended up just bailing out a bunch of German banks. Yeah, uh, no, no. What happened? Uh, if you read my book, uh, Killing the Host, uh, the people who were bailed out were Citibank and the American banks. Uh, uh, Tim Geithner went over there and uh, Obama talked uh, with uh, uh, Merkel and said the American banks had written derivatives, uh, credit guarantees against default. And uh, Geithner said, and Obama both said, if uh, these banks have to pay, we will bankrupt Europe. We will push you, uh, uh, we will not take a loss. You must take, put all the loss on Greece. It was Obama and Geithner not German bondholder, not German and French bondholders who had it all. If they stood up, they said, uh, uh, they said, look, we've got the class war is on and here's how we can crush 
any uh, uh, attempt by the Greeks to uh, put, put labor's voice first. Uh, uh, this was the, the, mo the most criminal, vicious, vile act of the uh, Obama administration. And, and uh, the fact that uh, you could just have uh, in your uh, damn Democratic Party a campaign that looks up to Obama, that thinks this is a success story, if you don't realize that the Obama administration was the depth of the Democratic Party and that that was, uh, that nothing you do can be at all helpful until you get rid of uh, the whole o Obama and Clinton gang, then uh, you're not going to be successful in doing anything. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I remember I read that uh, Yanis Varoufakis book, uh, Adults in the Room. Uh, I thought it was the, the Germans who were, uh, uh, the German banking groups that were kind of uh, uh, they were the bondholders. They were quite correctly the bondholders, but they had all bought uh, credit insurance from the uh, American okay. banks, and so they wouldn't have lost a penny. If, if the, the default, uh, uh, they would have simply turned to, the Ameri to Obama's backers, to the banks that funded him, uh, for, uh, to be made whole. So uh, the, the German and French uh, banks did all the debt, but the Americans insured it all. That was the, that was the important key that people don't talk about. I mean, they don't talk about any of the really uh, awful things that Obama did, the, the hateful things that his admi administration did. Yeah, and they really, I mean, doubled down on it with uh, putting Joe Biden, uh, uh, putting him out front, uh, but also uh, on the uh, Obama front, there was also that PROMESA, the Puerto Rico bankruptcy law. Yes. Uh, where you've got a board of uh, people who are, uh, at least at first, I think, not from Puerto Rico, uh, from a bunch of, uh, uh, at least a few were from uh, banks in the States who had ties to people who had originated the debt. Yep. Uh, sort of steering the ship. So uh, maybe yeah. I don't know if you could uh, say, say a little bit more about uh, uh, the Obama administration's role in the Puerto Rico debt situation and what we might be able to do. He's always stood up for the creditors against the debtors, and it doesn't matter whether the, uh, uh, the debts uh, are uh, what used to be called odious debts, meaning debts that were uh, taken on behalf of the people that did not benefit the people at all. Uh, Puerto Rico would have a legal case in international court to say, this is an odious debt. It was loaded onto it. We cannot pay, uh, and uh, we cannot sac uh, do. It's wrong to sacrifice us or Haiti for that matter, or other countries in that position, uh, just to pay bondholders that have been able to uh, create the money simply on an electronic keyboard uh, to lend to us. This is a, this is a crazy system. And uh, there has to, uh, I mean, right now, I think there are a group of third world countries that are planning uh, to uh, get together to uh, insist that they can't pay the debts as a result of the coronavirus credit. And uh, I mean, that may be one of the first uh, groups of people to uh, uh, repudiate uh, uh, the, the dollar debt uh, that they have. Uh, we're talking about redenominating the debt in their own currency, uh, dual exchange rates, uh, the whole panoply. Okay, uh, I like that idea. Uh, and Alex, anything else? Um, just that, uh, you know, I think <laughs> if we're gonna um, prevail, in our struggle, uh, it's going to be because um, enough people learned what was going on, you know, um, and that we developed the confidence in, in each other and in ourselves to to act. And so uh, I want to thank Michael for joining us, uh, helping to uh, share his insights among our 500 email list members and anyone else who gets this video. Um, and that I hope we have opportunities to do this uh, with larger and larger audiences. Yeah, we need a political education pro uh, project about the economics of uh, the politics. Yeah, definitely. And we'll, uh, we'll keep you in the loop about uh, what we're doing going forward. We're uh, planning a few for maybe uh, July and uh, going forward. But uh, thank you again so much for your time, Michael. Thank you. Good to be here. Talk to you again, Michael. Thanks, James. Thanks for organizing this, James. Right, thank you. And so, uh, how do we get a, 